Ellen is the director of the graphic design program for MICA. Um, she's also the curator for um, the contemporary design at Cooper Hewitt, the Con National Design Museum in New York. Um, she's an author of numerous books on design and is really well known for her work in typography, which I find personally really fascinating, um, this field where you create this really intricate narrative out of the actual physical text. Um, I find that really fascinating, so I'm thrilled to have her on that. Um, her book, DIY, Design It Yourself, to me is also the hallmark of why she's perfect for this. In that book, she says to readers, um, design it yourself, you don't have to rely on somebody else. You can make this for you, I'll show you how. Um, that book to me is like, in these really overwhelmed states, like I just wanna make everything. She's like the Xanax for me, like, <laughs> it's okay, I'll show you how. Um, so, thanks to Ellen Lupton. <laughs> Here you go. Well, it's really, whoa, it's really fun to be here in Baltimore doing an event. Um, I go all over the place, but rarely do I have a chance to actually meet people in Baltimore, and I'm so excited to see so many people I know and then people I don't know who are willing to come out in sub-freezing weather. Um, <laughs> to talk about making and creating and doing. Um, so I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm a graphic designer. I think I spend more time talking about design than actually doing it um, as an educator and so forth. Um, I like to tell stories. Um, and what I'm gonna do this morning is I'm gonna talk to you about uh, an exhibition that I currently have traveling around the country called Graphic Design Now in Production. And then I'm gonna talk about a top secret thing in the few minutes left. Um, and I'm gonna ask not to have that be on the internet because I'm not supposed to talk about it. Um, but so stay tuned for <laughs> secrets to be revealed. Um, yeah, so like I like stories and my story is called Welcome to Busy Town. And um, something a little bit dim with the slide, but yeah, okay. So, so Busy Town um, is, a, is a place invented by Richard Scarry, who's a great children's book illustrator. And I grew up with Busy Town, and, and my kids grew up with Busy Town, too. And it's a sort of amazing um, place where everything has a label. It's sort of Michel Foucault for the pre-K set. Um, and everybody has a job. Everybody is fully employed in busy town doing their busy things. And, and, and I love this place, um, but I often wonder, well, what about the graphic designers? Um, <laughs> so I added one to busy town so that we would be fully represented. Um, and so all these busy people are, are doing things with tools, special tools for all their jobs, all the things they have to make and do. Um, these are the tools that used to be used by graphic designers. And I can safely say I'm the oldest person in the room, and probably most of you have never seen these tools. Some of them are illegal. Some of them should be in some museum of Swiss design somewhere. Um, but this is how we used to make graphic design. We made it by hand, um, and it wasn't really all that fun. It was actually really hard, and I was never very good at using these tools. I kind of sneaked in through the angle of language and writing and got away with being a slob because I had kind of clever ideas. Um, there's, a, there's a cartoon by Daniel Close called Art School Confidential that was published in 1991, which is really the moment when the tools all changed. And what you see here is the three worst possible outcomes of an art school education. Um, and right there in the middle is graphic design. And that's in between working as a clerk in an art supply store and flipping burgers. You could be a graphic designer. And this guy is miserable. Um, he is not a happy person. And it's partly because he hates his tools, um, the toxic thinner and the hot wax machine and the X-Acto knife and all these things that are no longer used were really an, an oppressive part 
of being a designer, and they, they, you know, a lot of people didn't want to do design because of that. Now that all changed when the little beige box took over the world, and all those tools got dumped into this equipment that was called desktop publishing, even though it didn't really fit on your desktop, and it wasn't really publishing either. And this was very scary for graphic designers, where we, we scare easily. Um, we were sure that design would be wiped out, that secretaries would take all our jobs because now they knew what Helvetica and Times Roman were, and those were like the biggest secrets of the profession. And once that was out, we were in big trouble, so there was a lot of fear about what would happen. Now, actually, graphic design didn't get wiped out. Um, the profession got bigger. Um, Today, there's over 250,000 people employed as graphic designers in the US alone. Um, it's a much bigger field than product design or architecture. A lot of us are working at Fast Signs and FedEx Office, but nonetheless, we are employed as graphic designers making stuff, making communication, making type. Um, and secretaries didn't take our jobs because actually we all became secretaries too and we spent a lot of our time just communicating, you know, doing email and all of that. Um, and the tools got better and better. They just got more and more exciting. Um, they became <laughs> seductive and colorful and full of appeal to that hungry mind. Um, but not everything in busy town is fabulous. There are problems, especially in our post-2008 economy, um, where we seem to be working harder and harder for kind of static pay and remuneration. The clients want more, they want it faster. You have while you wait graphic design and $99 logos and um, all this um, kind of pressure to produce and produce, some of which is, is actually created by the tools, uh, which are more accessible, more understandable. Um, our process has become less mysterious, um, and that's not always a great thing for graphic designers. Um, but I like to think that those very tools that are turning the wheels of fortune in busy town are also tools that we can use to have fun um, and make stuff and do stuff for ourselves. Um, so tools like print on demand, uh, low cost digital printing, web-based distribution, these are the new tools. So, so the first wave of the computer revolution, the whole desktop publishing thing, changed the way graphic design is made for the printer. Um, but what's happening now is the second wave is about how graphic de design is distributed to people. Um, and when you put those two things together, you have a very powerful system where small producers, small makers, um, writers, um, editors can become their own publishers and make their own stuff and actually get it to people. Um, so it's a kind of wonderful um, merging of our new tools and old tools. Um, and that's really the subject of my exhibition, Graphic Design Now in Production, um, which was co-organized by Cooper Hewitt and Walker Art Center. It's been traveling around the country since October 2012. Its last stop is at some school called RISD in Providence. It's opening on April 17th. Um, easy trip on Southwest Airlines. Um, I urge you to go and see it if you haven't seen it already, and I'll just talk a little bit about the ideas in the show. That's Andrew Blauvelt, who's my co-curator, um, the amazing uh, director of design at the Walker Art Center. This is a picture of him at the Walker Art Center. I love this photograph because the word graphic design is bigger than Andrew's head, <laughs> and that's how it should be. We should be in a museum, and we should be tall and proud and out, and we are <laughs> graphic designers. Um, this is the book uh, that Andrew and I did with the, with the Walker. It is an amazing compendium of fun facts and critical essays and 
um, and stuff all jammed into this book that's inspired by the last Whole Earth catalog, uh, which was really the, the kind of Bible of the 60s, like how to get high, how to do macrame, how to give birth <laughs> in your bathtub. And we thought that was kind of a great model for like looking at graphic design and tools and the empowerment of the designer today to make their own um, stuff. And so here's just a few of the things. For example, the Rizo digital duplicating machine is a low cost digital printer that lots of designers and editors and small arts collectives actually have this machine sitting in their office. And the machine allows them to not only design a book, but also to publish it, to print it. So instead of outsourcing it to the other side of the globe, small manufacturers can do their printing right where they are. So it's kind of a reversal of globalization. And then, of course, you use the internet to actually sell the book to anybody who might want these obscure publications. Um, Anthony Burrell is an amazing graphic designer in London. Um, and he does these posters that he prints himself using letterpress technology. And he sells them online to people that collect this kind of stuff. Um, and they're not advertising a product or an event. They're his ideas. They're his philosophy of design. And he has a huge following. And this stuff is snapped up the instant he puts it out there because there's a community worldwide that wants you know, graphic design and wants this kind of kind of message. So that poster, Oil and Water Do Not Mix, um, is made with ink that he made himself from oil from the uh, BP golf spill. So that's like doing it, making it, doing it yourself, and then printing it and getting it out there, making your own tools, making your own stuff. Jörg Laney is an amazing uh, graphic designer and software engineer. He invented a scriptographer and paper JS and um, he creates amazing um, tools that other people can use to create design and art. So this is a tool we featured in the exhibition. It's software that runs a um, vinyl cutting machine. But instead of cutting vinyl, the machine cuts holes in paper using this special font that Jörg created. Um, and so visitors to the exhibition uh, can make their own poster. And what what Jörg has designed is the system, the tool, the method for putting that out there. And there's, there's people um, in the exhibition waiting in line um, to use this amazing machine. Um, in New York City, Cooper Hewitt hosted this exhibition on Governor's Island um, because our mansion is closed for renovation. So Governor's Island is this <laughs> island off the coast of um, lower Manhattan, the tip of the the island, um, and it was free. You take a seven minute ferry ride and arrive on this island where you can have a picnic and ride a bike and see some graphic design. Um, and here's some shots from inside our installation. This is a piece by Daniel Etock. Um, and what he did is he created a series of, of prints that were actually produced in the gallery for our exhibition. And he made them by laying sh sheets of paper over a grid of magic markers magic, that's us in graphic design. Um, and the idea was to take this, this tool that's basically obsolete, um, that's a very kind of um, workaday, as an art supply that like real artists wouldn't use, right? I think some schools even forbid their students from using magic markers because they're so you know, commercial. Um, and he used that to make these beautiful <coughs> prints, or are they drawings, or are they posters, right? They're um, a, a record of the tool making process itself. Um, there's more of the installation in Governor's Island. It's a very raw um, environment, very low ceilings, and um, the installation by Project Projects, I thought, really made graphic design look, look good and kind of um, accessible and fun. Some of it is not so pretty. This really looks like an elementary school. Um, but what we learned is that on Governor's Island, um, our building was the only air-conditioned building on the whole island. We also had the only plumbed toilets. <laughs> so anybody arriving for a day of, of fun, um, if they wanted to use the bathroom, they'd have to walk past all this graphic design on their way. We thought that was pretty great, and it was the most interesting <coughs> crowd I've ever seen in a design exhibition, because a lot of people just like turned up there. like what is this stuff? And they would really like stay and, 
can kind of enjoy it and engage in, in doing stuff and, and thinking and, and talking about graphic design. Um, there's also a, a cash machine in the building. Um, and to me, this, this sign by Project Projects kind of summed up for me that the promise and invitation of graphic design is like <laughs> toilets and an ATM. You know, like, come on in, we're, we're available, it's cool. That's my last slide. And I am right on time, promised I would. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's my little talk on making and the how and the why and the tools. And, we have uh, 10 minutes for questions, and then we let Tony go back to work. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, if anybody has questions, we have about 10 minutes. Any other questions? Yes. How are the consumers of graphic design involved? How are consumers? Well, I think that um, people have become more design conscious, and people today, the consumer base, is more aware of design, more critical of design, partly because we as a field have brought up the quality so much. Um, and I think that that's, um, it's also because people have more access to the same tools that we have. And so I think those two things together have created a much more design savvy public. Um, on the one hand, it's Target and Martha Stewart, you know, making better stuff for people to see and use. And Apple, of course, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but it's also, you know, like my kids use, you know, Photoshop and Flash and all the same stuff that we use. <laughs> so there's like a whole generation of people that are um, exposed to actually making, right? The make. <laughs> yeah. I like that question. One more, yeah? Uh, I work uh, with video and graphic design, and it seems like um, they're not, at least as far as I can tell, they're not really developing together or seem to be coming into a, a kind of crossing over each other. Um, really? Yeah, they don't seem like a lot of the video people don't tend to really interact too much with graphic design people, and they do tend to prefer static things like logos. As graphic design seems to, or the consumers, feeling out that question, seem to uh -huh. be more um, interested or seem to be developing GIFs or like small little video pieces that right. seem to now, at least on websites, um, operate alongside static images. Yeah. So what role do you think graphic designers can play in kind of wedging themselves into that world? It's funny because so so the question is about the relationship between video and graphic design and. The, you know, the video people maybe haven't discovered graphic design yet, but I think that gra graphic designers all use video, and I think this is a change even just in the last couple of years, you know, like Kickstarter, like, you have to be able to make a video. I don't know any graphic designers who don't use video in some way. Maybe they're not actually shooting video, but the ability to do some kind of editing and s simple animating things together. It just seems like it's really part of graphic design now. I mean, all my students do stuff with video. It's just like you have to, it's like you have to be able to. So I guess then the challenge is to get the video people to put nice type on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it all goes together and now we see these you know, layouts that have video in them. That's great. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Um, so how do you bridge the gap as a student between sort of the more finite aspects of design and culture and mm -hmm. then Well, at MICA, we really mix all the media together, and students are working in print and multimedia. I don't really see there to be a divide between the kind of formal visual language of design. I think it really communicates across all the media. I think a difference is that, you know, in interactive media, 
users expect if there's something is a different color or something is behaving strangely that it's going to do something when you touch it, right? <laughs> so that's definitely another dimension as is the video dimension. But I feel that the kind of fundamental notions of, of image and grid and type are kind of there across the board and still really communicate pretty universally as what makes it graphic design. One more, Daniel? Sorry. Okay. Um, so as someone who doesn't do design, but like ask people to do design. A client. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how would you like, you know, ask somebody to make something for you and then if you don't like it, you know, like, you know like, how do you balance How do you fire what them? The, <laughs> what the client wants versus what your creative process is. So the question, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm putting Katie out of the job. <laughs> I want to do everything. So the question is about clients and graphic designers and clients and, you know, why can't we get along? Um, we need clients. And I, I often talk to designers who are like, oh, I have this terrible client. They keep choosing the worst solution to the problem. It's like, the, we need clients. We really can't, ha you know, it's great if Daniel Etat can make his prints with magic markers, but that's like the edge of the profession. We, we really depend on users, the public, and the clients that connect us to those people. 90% um, of graphic design is communication. It's that conversation, and this is why the $99 logo is not a real threat to the actual business of graphic design, because what we do is talk to our clients about who they are and how design will function for them. And, and we have as much to learn from you as you do from us. So this kind of animosity thing, it, it's not good for business. You know, it's like we, we really need each other. So I say like calm down and communicate <laughs> what you, communicate your idea and you as a client, you know. Communicate what you want. It's our job to supply. <laughs> <laughs> and to move it forward, you know, to bring it up a notch, right? Always, always up a notch. Well, thank you guys, and I have a great day at work. <laughs>